Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Bloodstones. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules of the game as it's being played, and I will be showing the first couple of rounds today. Now, before I get into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as a subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support this channel, then please go to patreon.com slash John Gets Games, and there you can gain access to a wide variety of perks, like my exclusive episodes where I give my opinions about all the games that I'm playing recently. You can also watch some videos early and advertisement free, and you will also gain access to an exclusive podcast where you can hear audio versions of all of the vlogs I make. Now, the last thing I'd like to ask before we jump into the game is that if while you're watching this, some part of the game really jumps out to you as interesting, then please comment about that down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles because I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. I also want to emphasize that this is a prototype version of the game. All of the art in the game has actually been redone from what you see here, and here are some of the examples of the changes, but keep in mind, this video is going to use the older art style. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Now, it's set in a fantastical realm called Fall, and in it, each player is in control of various factions that are vying for control of the realm. Each of the factions have their own specific strengths, and players will try to leverage those to gain advantages on their opponents. Now, during this game, on a player's turn, they are going to go through a variety of steps. They'll start by potentially pillaging villages where their units are. Then they could move zombies if they happen to be part of the Necromancer faction. After that, players can perform as many actions as they want. They might build new units onto the board, as well as move units and start battles. Now, whenever you build or move units, you have to actually spend your tokens. These are multi-use. For example, you could discard one other tile to place this ship into play, or you could spend this to put something else in play. And the tiles also have these pips, and those are used for various things, like actually moving units around. For example, you could discard this ship. It has four pips, and that would give you four movement points. Once a player has completed all of their actions, including any battles that they are currently in, then they could construct villages by putting those out onto the board. After that, they'll draw back to their maximum hand size of tiles. And if, while drawing, a player runs out of tiles in their stack, then they will immediately score one point for every village of theirs that's currently out on the board. And then they'll take all of their discarded tiles, shuffle those up, and create a new series of face-down stacks. Each time a player runs out of their tiles, they'll move their shuffle marker over once, and depending on the number of shuffles players have made, will dictate how long the game will actually take to play. In a three-player game, for example, we are going to keep playing until all players have shuffled twice. Once the game is over, all players will have a chance to pillage opposing villages one last time, and then players will gain points for the villages they have pillaged, as well as any citadels they've defeated over the course of the game, and once we add up all the points, the player with the most will be the winner. Now, as I mentioned a little bit ago, one of the actions in this game is battling, and that is going to happen whenever there are two different forces in one zone. That action is going to have players drawing random battle tiles out of these bags. Players can then swap out one of these tiles for one of the ones they have in their hand, and then we compare the number of pips that are revealed. And on top of that, you can add a variety of extra benefits that depend on the terrain where you are fighting, as well as potentially other factors. The player with the highest strength will win the battle. They will then gain one point for every opposing unit in that battle. Then the loser destroys one unit, and they have to then retreat with the remaining units they have in their army. Now, that was a very high-level overview of how battle works, as well as how the entire game works. And I will describe how all of this works in detail while we are actually playing. On that note, let's actually start the game. And today, we are going to play as the Dragon Riders, which is the orange faction over here. Now we are also the starting player, so let's focus over here and now take the first turn of the game. Now, as you can see, we have a variety of things in front of us, and one very important thing is our player aid. On the back here, it shows all of the different units that the Dragon Riders have, and on the front, we have a variety of other information that will help us out as we're playing. Now, the Dragon Riders are actually elven, and we have learned to not only ride the dragons that can be found in this land, but we've also teamed up with Lizardmen to help us out with our cause. When we focus in a little bit more, you can see that this details all of the units that we have in our deck, and in the bottom left there is the dragon, and that is a unique unit that we get as the dragon riders. Now we didn't start with any dragons in our hand, and I'll explain why dragons are so great once we actually gain access to one. 
So let's start our turn and we can flip this over and we can see that on a player's turn there are five steps that have to be performed in order. The first step is called pillage and this would let us pillage opposing villages out on the board. Although at this point, there are no villages, so I'll explain how the pillage step works later on when it becomes more relevant. The second step is the move zombies step, and this is only performed by the necromancer faction, and they only do this if they actually have zombies. We are not to the necromancers, so we can skip right past that and move to the third step, which is main actions. And in this step, we can build units, move units, and battle as many times as we want to and in any order. So let's focus down a little bit and look at our hand of tiles. Now these are hidden from our opponents, and during this main action step, we can spend these tiles in a variety of ways to do these actions I already mentioned. Now these tiles are multi-use, and I think we want to start by building units, and in particular, let's build these swords right there. Now, as you can see in the top left corner, it shows a single black box, and that is the shape of a tile. That means in order to build this tile, we need to discard one other tile from our hand. Now, we can discard any of these tiles for this payment, and I think we will discard this tile right here. Now, as you can see, that actually doesn't have a block icon. That means if we wanted to build this, it would not have a cost, and we could just build it right onto the board. However, this is a weaker tile than the swords, so I think we are going to spend this as a payment to then build the swords out onto the board. When we spend the tiles, we actually discard them to a face-up pile near our area. Next up, we have to place this built unit out onto the board, and specifically it has to go into an area that has our citadel in it or one of our villages. Now, we haven't actually placed any villages out yet. We'll do that later on this first turn. So at the very beginning of the game, we just have this citadel, and we place this out during setup. That means this area right here is the only area on the board that we can build to, so let's go ahead and build the swords there. Now, as you can see, we have a couple of tiles over here already, and that's because as part of setup, every single player drew nine tiles and then got up to five build actions to place units out. As you can see, we spent our five putting these three units onto the board, and we could have potentially placed units that did not have a cost during setup, but I didn't think it made sense at the time. So, once again, we can place this over here, and it's worth noting that we can just stack these things up as much as we want to. There's actually no unit limit in this game. Any number can be in each one of these areas. So, we've built that one swords unit, and now we can come back over here, and obviously we have less tiles in our hand. Now, I think we want to build again. Remember, you can perform the build, battle, and move actions as many times as you want, and in any particular order. Now, let's go ahead and build this lizard man, and as you can see, it does not have a cost, so we can simply build it into an area with a citadel or a village. Once again, during this first turn of the game, the citadel is our only option. Now, at this point, you might be wondering what the difference is between these units, and with that in mind, let's take a look at the back of our player aid. Now, as you can see up here, it says swords, and it shows a four. That means we have four of those swords tiles within all of our tiles, and then over here, it says plus one. That means swords are going to add one strength to all battles that they are in. Now, we also have four lizard men in our stacks, but then the difference between them and the swords is they give a plus one strength only when they are attacking. Lizard men don't do anything when they are defending. While we're over here, we can also look at the skirmishers, which we discarded as a payment to place the swords down. As you can see, we have four of those as well. They also add plus one to combat, but only when that combat happens in a forest. At the moment, I don't really foresee us fighting in a forest anytime soon, which is why I thought that spending the skirmishers right now made sense. Well, at this point, we can look back at our hand, and one thing you might have noticed is this tile right over here doesn't have much going on. All of this is blank, but then on the right side, there are five of these pips, and that's because this tile can never actually be a unit. This tile can only be used for its pips, so it can be used for movement as well as building, and it could even be used to increase our strength during battle. Now, I do think we want to move next, even though we could build more, and let's actually discard these shields for the movement. Now, whenever you discard a tile for movement, you look at the pips only, and that is the amount of movement points that you get for that move action. Then, of course, that tile is discarded. When we take a look at our player aid, if we had actually built this onto the board as a shield, then it would have added plus one into combat, but only when defending. And much like the skirmishers, I'm not sure if we're going to be defending anytime soon, so I felt like spending it for movement points made more sense. All right, we now have three movement points to use. With that in mind, let's now focus back on the map, and with those movement points, we can move our units into adjacent areas. Now, it's worth noting that things like citadels and castles are technically units, but they can never be moved. That being said, we have a ship out here, as well as these three tiles, which are movable units. 
Now, whenever you move a unit, you go into an adjacent area, and then you pay an amount of movement points depending on what the terrain is in that area. As you can see, there are six different types of terrain on the map, and on our player aid, it tells us the number of movement points we have to spend to move into each of these. In order to move into the plains, it costs one movement point. Moving into forests costs two. Hills are going to cost three. And then mountains are not applicable, because as the dragon riders, we can't actually move into these mountains. Now that's not entirely true, because technically one of the effects of our dragons is that they can fly onto any space including mountains, but all of our non-dragon units can never go into mountains. Next up, we can see it costs one movement to go into desert spaces, which on this map are down here on the very bottom, and then finally it costs one move to move a ship to an adjacent water space. Now, as you can see, that says ships and dragons only, and that's because, once again, dragons can go anywhere. Now, on these water spaces, only ships and dragons can remain, so that means we could spend one of our movement points to move this ship to an adjacent water area. In fact, we could do that a couple of times if we wanted to. Now, instead of doing that, we could actually use this ship to transport our other units. The way this works is you can move a unit through a contiguous line of your ships and then drop them off onto an adjacent area to the water with those ships. It doesn't cost anything to move through the ships, but you do have to pay the associated cost for wherever you land. That means, for example, if our ship was there and we had another ship over here in that water area, then for two movement, we could move this horse through that ship and through that ship over here into that forest area, because once again, it takes two movement points to move into the forest. So as you can see, having ships on the water can be a very effective way to move your units around for very little cost. Of course, right now, our ship is there, and we haven't actually built this ship. Now let's focus over here. As you can see, each player started the game with a citadel being placed onto the board, and in fact, in reverse player order, we all placed these down, and the citadels had to go either in the plains, the hills, or the forests. Now, after that, those were the locations that we were able to build our setup units, and we can see that the hill folk are a little bit closer to us than the necromancers are way down here. Now, at any point in time, we can look at all of the units that players have within these stacks of tiles. And of course, we're going to use that to help figure out what exactly we want to do. Now, again, we have three movement, and if we wanted to, we could split this up. For example, we could send this lizard man over here using that boat, and then we could maybe send both of these over there. Also, we could just keep all of these clustered up if that made sense. Now, I don't really see a reason to head over to this island with an attacking force right now. Instead, I think let's use our three movement, heading from here, using that boat, and then landing right over there. Effectively, I'm looking to project our power to the east, and I'm also planning on building a village right over here to give us an opportunity to build more units out closer to our opponents, where maybe we can actually win some fights and get some points that way. This does mean we've moved a bunch of attacking forces out of our citadel, but our citadel is quite protected. By itself, it has five strength in combat, and this castle adds three more strength when defending. Now, I know I haven't described the details of combat and how strength works, but having eight defending strength over here is quite a bit, and I feel comfortable leaving it at the moment. Well, at this point, we've used up all three of our movement points, and if we wanted to, we could discard another one of our tiles to gain more movement points. As you can see, this ship has four pips on it, so that would be four movement points, and this one right here has five pips. Now, it's worth noting that any unused movements are not saved, so if possible, you don't want to leave any as a remainder. Just because we can spend these doesn't mean that we should, and in fact, I think I am not going to do that, and now we are going to end our main action phase. We built and we also moved, but we did not battle. Now, battle is going to happen whenever the active player has units in an area that has opposing units in it, and obviously that is not currently the case, and I'll explain how attacking works later on in the tutorial. So we can move to the fourth step of our turn, which is the build villages step. Now, as you can see, we started with 20 villages in our supply, and now is the time where we can build these out onto the board. Now, the cost to do that is listed over here in the village cost area. It costs one pip to build into the plains, one pip to build into a forest, and two pips to build into the hills. Now, I said pips because we actually discard up to one tile during the build villages step, and then we use those pips to construct those villages. So we could discard this one to get five pips worth of village building power power, or we could discard this one to get four, or of course we could discard none of them and not put any villages out. Now I think discarding this to gain five village building power is probably a good idea, so let's discard this. 
Now, that means we could potentially build up to five villages. Of course, if we built into hills, then we're not going to be building the full five. So let's focus back on the map. Now, whenever we construct a village, we have to place it so that you can trace a path through your units back to another village or to a citadel. What that means is we could place this into an area that has our own units or even adjacent to an area with our own units as long as we could trace that path. For example, if we built right over here into the hills, that would take two of our village build power, and then we could do that because we can trace a path through these units to the ship back to the citadel. If these units had moved over here, then we would not be able to build into this area or any of those because, of course, we could not draw a path back to a village or the citadel. However, we could build here because then we could once again draw that path. And in fact, when we construct villages, we can chain off previous villages. So if it looked like this, we could construct our first village here, and then we could construct our second one right over there because now we can trace a path back to one of our villages or the citadel. Now, obviously, our units are right over here. And I do think we want to build our first village into this area. That is essentially going to be our eastward outpost. Remember, when you build new units, you can build them on spots with our villages or our citadels. So by having this here, we can now build units all the way out here. Now, that is in the plains, which means it costs one of our village build points. This means we still have four more remaining. So let's build another one. Now, whenever you construct villages, it's important to know that every single one of the plains areas can have up to two of your villages in them, whereas each one of the forest areas and hill areas can have at most one. Having a second village in an area does not give you any extra defensive positioning. It just lets you put more villages onto the map because these can be worth points to us, and I'll explain how that works later on. Now, I don't think we need to put a second village out here. In fact, that would maybe be a little bit risky. Remember, the first step of a player's turn is called pillage, and it lets you pillage opposing villages. So having too many of these out here close to our opponents might tempt them too much to go and pillage them. So I think for our second one, let's actually use our ship and draw a path over here and start a village on this island. That means if we want to, we could now build units on this island, and that might make sense if the Necromancer player moves over there, or maybe they won't, and we can just occupy this island with our villages. That's used two of our five village build power. So we have three more, and I think we are going to build three more villages. Now let's go here, because that's adjacent to the citadel, and then let's go here, because again, that's adjacent to the citadel or one of your other villages. We have this one now, and I think let's go over there into the forest. Once again, it only costs one of our build value to go into the forests. The main difference between the plains and the forest being that we can have at most one village in the forest. And also it's worth noting, again, that it takes two movement to go into a forest. So that means villages in the forest are a little bit harder for opponents to move into and to try to pillage. Now, if we had wanted to, we could have not built over here and maybe done that to get more of our villages in the forest, but I like the idea of having a foothold on this island. Well, we've finished building villages, so that means it's now time for the fifth and final step of our turn, which is the draw tiles step. Now, technically, before we draw tiles in this step, the first thing we have to check is to see if we have any units in the desert. Now, all units in the desert are going to immediately perish unless they are a dragon, a lizard man, a goblin, or a zombie. Now, we actually control dragons and lizard men. That means this lizard man unit could continue to hang out in the desert and it's one of the very few units that actually could stay down here. Obviously, we aren't down there right now, but it is important to remember that very few units can survive in the desert, although, of course, you can move through the desert and then back out again within the same turn. Now it's time for us to draw new tiles. And the way this works is we simply draw new tiles from our face-down stacks until we reach our hand limit of six. Now, six is the standard hand limit for the game. I do want to point out that there is another faction that we aren't playing with called the Horse Lords, and one of their special powers is their hand size is actually seven tiles instead of six. Once again, we aren't actually seeing the Horse Lords in this game, though. We currently have one tile, so that means we have to draw five tiles to get it back up to six. We drew another ship. Ooh, nice, we drew our dragon. Now, technically, we only have two dragons in all of these tiles, and I think I'll explain how these dragons work in more detail on our next turn. We have to continue to draw, though. This one is a siege engine that has extra strength when attacking castles or citadels. We can continue to draw. We found a second siege engine, and then we found another lizard man. 
All right, we're now up to our hand limit of six. Now, if while drawing tiles, we ran out of tiles and we needed more to actually fill our hand, then we would immediately do a village scoring and then build a new stack of face down tiles. Now, the way village scoring works is once again, it only happens when you run out of tiles in your stacks and you then gain one victory point for every village you have out there on the board. For this reason, it makes a lot of sense to get villages out there as quickly as you can to try and score as many points as you can when you cycle through your stacks. Once you've done that scoring, you can then move your shuffle marker over once on the shuffle track. This tracks how many times each player has gone through their entire deck and shuffled up a new one. This is very important because that's how the game ends. Now, in a three or four player game, as soon as all players have shuffled at least twice, that is going to trigger the end of the game, and the game ends immediately once that condition is met. In a two player game, it only happens once both players have shuffled at least three times. Once that happens, we then perform a couple end game actions and scoring, and I'll explain how all of that works later on in the tutorial. The final thing you do after increasing that shuffle track is you take all of your tiles in your face up discard pile, put them face down, shuffle them up, and then build new stacks that you can then draw from. Obviously, that's not the case for us, and as you can see, the more tiles that you use on your turn, and as you can see, the more tiles you play on your turn, the quicker you will go through all of your tiles and then score your villages. Of course, many tiles are going to be added to the map as we build, so when you rebuild your new stacks, it's very likely there's going to be significantly less tiles in there than there were at the beginning of the game. Well, at this point, our turn is now over because we've finished our draw step, and that means play can move clockwise over to the Hill Folk player. Once again, on a player's turn, they're going to go through those five steps in order. The Hill Folk don't currently have a way to pillage any villages, so again, I'll talk about that later. And the second step, again, only counts for the Necromancer, where they could potentially move zombies. That means the Hill Folk can go right to the third step, where they can now build, move, as well as potentially attack. It looks like they've decided to move first, and they are going to discard this tile to do it. As you can see, that shows four pips, so that gives them four movement to use. Now, when it comes to movement, the Hill Folk actually have an advantage over the other factions. When we flip this over, you can look to the top, and it shows that they can move into hills for two movement points, whereas normally for the rest of the factions, it takes three. Also, the Hill Folk can move into mountains, and it takes three of their movement points, whereas no one else can go into mountains, except, of course, dragons, which are special, and I'll talk about dragons soon. Now, we can see for the desert and sea, as well as plains and forest, there is no difference for them. So the short version is they can move into hills better than the rest of us, and they can actually move into mountains with all of their units. So they have four movement points to use, and they are going to use their leader as part of this. With that in mind, let's focus over here, because as you can see, this leader has plus one strength in combat, and it says you can move one additional unit with the leader for no additional cost. So when you move your leader, they can take another unit along for free. I do want to point out that the Hill Folk, as well as Necromancers and the Dragon Riders, all have one leader, but when it comes to the Horse Lords, which we are not playing with today, one of their benefits is they have two of these leaders, and they can actually have a leader bring in another leader as a free movement, and that second leader can move another one, so if they cluster them up, they could move three units for the movement price of one. So let's focus back out on the map, and at the start of the game, the Hill Folk put four tiles over here next to their fortress. This one right here is indeed their leader, and they've decided they want to spend two of their movement points bringing their leader into this forest, and they're going to bring this giant along with them. Giants are great in combat, and I'll explain how that works later on. So the giant moved for free along with the leader, and again, the leader used two movement points to go into this forest. They still have two movement points left, and they've decided to go here with one of them, and then they're going to cross the river over there using the last one. So they're actually threatening one of our villages that we built at the end of our last turn. So they've used all that movement, and now they can continue to take actions. They could perform more movement actions by discarding more tiles if they wanted to. Now in this case, they actually want to build this cavalry. That has a cost of two other tiles, so that means they have to choose two to discard from their hand. They've decided to discard both of these shield unit tiles. Of course, they're only units when they're played out onto the board. In this case, they are simply a cost to pay for building this cavalry. That has to go down where their citadel is or one of their villages, and currently they don't have any villages, so they have to build the cavalry into their citadel. Next up, they're going to build this reaver, and it does not have a cost. Now, much like the lizard man that we have, the reaver is going to give them plus one strength when they are attacking in combat, but no benefits when they are defending. 
and of course they have to build this over into their citadel. At the moment, they only have one tile left in their hand, and they've decided to save it and now be done with their actions. Of course, one of the actions is combat, but that only happens if the active player has units in an area that has opposing units in it. We can see that the active player does have units with this village, but villages do not count as a unit, so there will not be a battle here. Now, the way these villages are attacked is with the first step of a player's turn, which is called pillaging. The way that works is the active player can discard exactly one tile from their hand, and then they can use the pips on that discarded tile to pillage any villages that are in the same areas as that player's units. That means if at the start of the hill folks next turn, they still have units over here with this village, they could discard a tile, and the cost to pillage is the same as building. So, in order to pillage a plane's village, Village, it would cost one pip from the tile that's discarded. It's also one pip to pillage a forest village and two pips to pillage a hills village. When you successfully pillage a village, you remove it from the board and you put it in front of you and you'll keep it for the rest of the game and every opposing village you have at the end of the game is going to be worth one point to you. Once again, when you perform the pillage step, you can discard at most one tile, but you can use the pips on those tiles to pillage different villages across multiple areas, again, as long as you have units in those areas. So, as you can see, the hillfolk is making a play to do that, but of course, they only have a chance to pillage this village at the start of their next turn, and we will get a turn before then, so potentially we can chase them off of this position, or maybe we'll just let them pillage that village and focus our efforts elsewhere. Well, speaking of villages, it looks like the hillfolk player is done with their actions, so now they have their own build villages step. As I said, they have a single tile in their hand, and they are going to discard this. As you can see, it is a castle tile, and it has four pips on it. Now, I do want to briefly mention that the castle tiles for the hillfolk work the same way as the other factions, except they're cheaper. As you can see, we built a castle earlier. Our castle cost two tiles to be built, whereas the hillfolk players only cost one, but both of these provide three defensive strength in combat. The other thing to note about the hillfolk's castles versus the other factions is they have more of them. As you can see, they have six of those, whereas all of the other factions only have four, and of course the hillfolk's castles are cheaper, so that means they have the ability to build walls out here on the board that defensively help their position, since they have so many more of those. Now in this case though, they are using this for the pips instead of building it out onto the map, and that means they now have four village build points to use. When it comes to building, the hill folk do not have any discounts. They also spend one build point for the plains, one for the forests, and two for the hills. In this case, they've decided to build a village here into the hills. That will cost them two of their four build points, and then they will use the other two going into this forest, and then they'll go into that forest as well. So they only built three villages during this step, whereas we built five. But of course, their villages are harder to get to to pillage because they are in tougher terrain. Well, the hillfolk can now end their turn with their draw step. They don't have any units over here in the desert to remove. So now they simply draw until they have six tiles in their hand. All right, play can now move clockwise. And that means it's time for the necromancers to take their turn. The first thing they check is if they can pillage, but that is not the case because they don't have any of their units in an area with an opposing village. This means they can move to the second step of the turn, which is the move zombies step, and again the necromancers are the only ones who actually perform this step. With this in mind, let's focus over here. Now, as you can see, the necromancers have four of these zombie tiles up here, and they are not shoveled in with their deck. Now, the only way the necromancer player summons these zombies onto the board is by winning battles with at least one necromancer. If that happens, then they summon one zombie for every defeated enemy unit, and those zombies go into the area where the battle happened. After that, the zombies will obviously be on the board, and the only way the Necromancer player can move zombies is by using this move zombies step of their turn. The way this works is they can move every one of their zombies on the board up to two spaces, and they don't have to pay for any movement cost, they simply move two spaces. The only restriction for the zombies is they are not allowed to move into sea areas by themselves, but if the Necromancer player has a ship, the zombies can move across those ships to a new area. And I want to specifically point out that zombies can enter mountainous regions. 
Now, all of the zombies can move during this move zombies step, and then the Necromancer player will move on to the actions part of their turn. And during the actions part of their turn, they are not allowed to use move actions to move any of their zombies. So the zombies effectively get free movement, but they are limited with how far they can go because they can't spend pips to move them during the action phase of their turn. It's worth noting zombies do add plus one strength in combat, so they are pretty good at fighting things, and I know I haven't actually explained how combat works just yet, and don't worry, I'll get to that soon. Obviously, right now, the Necromancer player does not have any zombies on the board, so they are going to skip the move zombies phase, and now they can perform actions. For the first action, they are going to build goblins. That does not have a cost, and the goblins work much in the same way as lizardmen. They add plus one strength in combat only when they're attacking. And also, goblins, like the lizardmen, can exist down here in the desert zones without being defeated. Now, they're going to build the goblins right over here, and then they are going to move, and they'll discard both of these tiles to do that. That is going to get them six movement points total. And with these, they want to move three units into this forest. Remember, the movement cost for forest is two. So this goblin can go there using two of their six. Then they can move this necromancer. That is going to use two more, so they have two left. And then they'll move this cavalry in there as well. So that used all six of their movement. After that, they have three tiles left in their hand, and they're actually done with actions. They don't want to move or build anymore. So they'll move into the build villages step of their turn, and they're going to discard another necromancer. They actually have four of these tiles total, and each one of them have five pips, which makes them not only great in combat to try and summon those zombies, but also great to discard to gain the strength of those pips. Now this means they gain five village build points. And much like we did, they are going to build five villages with these. Remember, it takes one build point to go onto the plains, one for the forest, and two for the hills. Now, the Necromancer player has decided they are going to build a village into this forest area that is adjacent to their citadel. Then they'll go here, they will go here, then they will go here, and that means they are actually adjacent to the sea. And in order to construct ships, you must have a village or your citadel adjacent to sea. So considering they're doing that, maybe that's telegraphing that they have a ship in their hand, or maybe not. They do have one last village they want to build, and they are going to build into this forest right over there. Technically, this isn't currently being defended by any of their units, but remember it takes two movement points to move into the forest, so they're hoping that that will be enough for now. And of course, if on our turn we decide to go in here to try and pillage that, then they could move in here in turn and attack us before that pillaging actually happens. So, that has used up all of their village build power, and now they can end their turn by drawing tiles. It looks like they used four out of their six tiles, so they only draw four more. With their turn done, that means it's once again time for us to go. We don't have any pillaging to do, so we can move right into our actions. And a priority for us is this incursion up here. Remember, if at the start of the Hillfolk turn, they have units in this area with our village, they could pillage that, removing it and gaining them one point at the end of the game. And obviously, we already spent resources to put this village on the board, so we are incentivized to defend it. Again, when we go through all of our tiles, we get one point for every village on the board. So that means by stopping them from removing this, we are also working towards getting more points ourselves when we do those scorings. Now, obviously, at this moment, our main army is pretty out of position. Maybe it was a mistake to push so far to the east, but either way, we do have a village over here, obviously, and when we build, we can build where villages are. That means we could build units directly into this area, and if during the action phase of your turn, any of the active player's units are in areas with opposing units, then the active player must perform an attack action in those areas before they can be done with all of their actions. Now, one thing the Hillfolk player was probably hoping was that we would not have a dragon. We have two dragons within our overall stack of tiles, which means the odds were somewhat low that we'd actually have one in our hand, but we do. Now, with that in mind, let's talk a little bit more about dragons, because I think I'm going to build this and then try to defend that region against the Hillfolk. Now, the dragons add four strength to every combat they're in, and that makes them the strongest combat unit in the game. Now that overpowering strength does have a drawback, and that's because every time you win a battle with a dragon in it, that dragon will be removed from the area and discarded, so you won't be able to use them again until you potentially draw them and play them later on in the game. In addition to that, dragons can move onto any type of terrain on the board, and that includes sea terrain. 
Also, when you move a dragon, you simply use one movement point to move them onto any type of terrain. The hills are a movement, the mountains are a movement, the dragons can go so far around the board for very little movement, and again, they are incredibly powerful in combat. In addition to that, dragons are one of the few units that can exist in the desert between rounds and not be defeated by it. Now, another big benefit of the dragons has to do with retreating in combat, and I'll explain how that works soon because we are going to be having combat in this round. The reason for that is because I want to build this dragon right over here in order to fight the hillfolk and defend this village. Now, the dragon does have a cost of two tiles, so we have to choose two tiles from our hand to discard. And I think we will discard both of these siege engines. Those add plus two strength in combat whenever it's against a castle or a citadel. So these are great later on in the game going against heavily fortified positions, but we're not in that point right now. And I think spending these to build that dragon makes a lot more sense. So the cost is paid and we only have three tiles left. Now, I don't think we want that dragon to fight by itself. Let's also send these lizard men in. They don't have a cost, so we can build them directly into that area. So we can add them right over here. At this point, we have two tiles left, and they are both ships. Now, if we wanted to, we could discard one of these to build the other one. That could go here or here, I suppose. And actually, I suppose there was another option for our turn. Uh, instead of spending all of that effort to build over here, we could have discarded those two siege engines to build a ship here and then there, and then we could have used these ships to move these units that we already have all the way over there to defend that area. But of course, if we did that, then we'd be leaving this village over here somewhat undefended. I think that's probably what we would have done if we hadn't had a dragon in our hand. But we do have the dragon, so I think that is going to be a better call for us. Obviously, we did not build these two though, and I think let's just hold on to them. Each of them have four pips, so we could spend one of these to build villages later on in our turn. And also, during combat, we do have the opportunity to use up to one tile. So I think holding on to these right now for the battle that's about to happen makes a lot of sense. Speaking of which, let's now perform the first battle action of the game. Now, as I mentioned before, during this actions step of your turn, if you have any of your units in an area with opposing units, then you must perform a battle action there before you finish this step. But of course, you can choose the order in which you perform these actions, which lets you move things in as well as build things before those battles happen. This means we must perform this battle before we finish the step, and I think now is the time to do it. So let's focus over here. Now combat takes place over five steps that we do in order, and it starts with an optional retreat step. In this case, we are attacking, which means the hill folk are the defenders. And during this step, the defenders may retreat from the battle. Now, in order to retreat, the defender must have an equal or greater number of cavalry units in that battle to the attacker. Obviously, the hill folk have no cavalry, and we have no cavalry, but we have a dragon. I mentioned that dragons offer an extra benefit with regards to retreating, and that is that whenever you attack with a dragon, the opponents can never retreat. In addition to that, if you ever defend with a dragon, then you always have the option to retreat, even if you do not have equal to or more cavalry. So that means if somebody attacks your dragon, you can always retreat to another area. Now, there are rules for retreating, and I'll explain how that works later on in combat, because after the battle is over, one of us will have retreated. So once again, the hillfolk cannot retreat because we have a dragon. Of course, if we did not have a dragon, then they could because they have zero cavalry and we would have zero cavalry that is equal to or greater, which would give them the opportunity to leave. The dragon is not affording them that opportunity, though which means we can now move into the second step of battle, where each player is going to take an identical bag of these combat tiles, shuffle them up, and then draw three or four of them. In order to figure out how many to draw, we have to focus back on the area. Now, what we do is we count the number of tiles in that combat, and the player who has more tiles will draw four, and then the other player will draw three. If the number of tiles is tied, then both players will draw three. So that means normally we would draw three and the hillfolk would draw three. However, they have a giant. When we focus on the hillfolk's player aid, it says that they will always draw four tiles if at least one giant is present in the battle. So that means if they only had one giant, they would still always draw four. And in this circumstance, we would also draw four because we would have a majority. Now, in this case, we are tied, so that means each of us should draw three, except this giant changes it for the hillfolk, and they will end up drawing four tiles, and again, we will only draw three because we do not have a majority of tiles. 
I do want to point out that it doesn't matter what's on these tiles, it's simply the number of them in the area where the battle is happening. So we can both shuffle up these bags and pull out the appropriate number. Now within these bags there are eight tiles, and within those eight tiles, there are two of the two values, two threes, two fours, and two fives. And again, this distribution is identical between the two bags, as you can see, even though the colors of the tiles are different. So let's draw our three tiles out of the bag. Ooh, and that's not a great hit. I was definitely hoping to find at least one five. At the same time, the Hillfolk player is also drawing tiles, and they get to draw four of them. After drawing those tiles, we then move into the third step of battle, where starting with the attacker, each player can optionally swap one of their battle tiles out with a tile that's currently in their hand. We are the attacker, and I think we're going to do this. Now, the number of pips on a tile is what adds to the combat. This is adding two pips, and that would add four. So let's swap this two value out and put it back into the bag, and then add this tile into the battle. Once again, you can only do this at most once. Now, after we as the attacker potentially did this, the defender can, and they have decided to. They're going to swap this battle tile out for that tile in their hand. Next up, we can move into battle step four, where each player can reveal the best three battle tiles they have. Now, we only have three, so we're going to obviously use all of these, but the Hillfolk player has four. That means they can choose the three highest out of those four, and that is going to be these right here. Now the pips on the battle tiles are going to be added to the strength of the combat. We have 4 plus 4 plus 3, which gives us 11. And then over here, unfortunately, the hillfolk are at an advantage. They have 5 plus 4 plus 5, which is 14, again to our 11. Now we add in the combat strength of the units in this area. We have a lizard man and a dragon. And remember, the lizard men add plus 1 strength when attacking, and we are attacking. And the dragons always add plus 4. So that means our units will add 5 more strength. And when we add that to 11, we have 16 strength total. Then over here for the hillfolk, they have a giant and a leader. The giants add 2 strength always, and the leaders add 1 strength always. So that means they have 14 plus 2 plus 1, which brings them to 17 strength total. Now that we know our strength amounts, we can move into the fifth step of battle, where we determine the victor. Now, if in this moment we were actually tied for our strength amount, let's pretend like maybe this wasn't there. In this case, that would be 16 to 16. In a tie, if the defending player has a shield, then they actually break the tie in their favor. Otherwise, we'll have to perform another battle in this area. For that, we would first discard any tiles that we substituted in, and then we would start with step two of battle, so there's no opportunity to retreat when you redo a battle with a tie. And then step two involves drawing more battle tiles. Then step three, you can once again have the attacker substitute out, but of course, at this point, they will have less tiles in their hand and less opportunities to do that. Now, we are going to keep doing this, potentially having many battles in an area, until we reach step five, where one of the players has more strength than the other. Obviously, we did not have a tie, though. Unfortunately, the Hillfolk had 17 to our 16, so that means in step 5, we can see that they are going to be winning this. Now, before we move on, we do have to discard all of the played substituted tiles, and then we also remove all of the battle tiles and put those back into the respective bags. Next up, the winning side is going to gain points equal to the number of units on the losing side. We had two units, so that means the Hillfolk players are going to gain two points for winning this battle. So that'll bring them up to two. And then the losing player must eliminate one unit in this battle. This is part of the reason why I wanted to put the lizard men in here. If we had done this battle with just the dragon and lost, then the dragon would become eliminated. Fortunately, the lizard man is there and we get to decide which unit is eliminated. So obviously that's going to be the lizard men. After that, all remaining units of the losing side must retreat. Now the way this works is you retreat to an adjacent area that is empty or has at least one piece of that player's color. By piece, I mean units or potentially village tokens. This means you cannot retreat into an area that only has opposing pieces in it, including if there's just one opposing village there. Now what this does mean is you could retreat into another battle. If, for example, we had some units over here and there were opposing units there and we hadn't gotten to that battle yet, we could retreat our dragon into that battle and then use that dragon again within the same turn. Again, there just has to be at least one piece of the losing player in that adjacent region to retreat there. Now all retreating units must go to the same area. And you do have to meet terrain restrictions. That means you cannot retreat into the mountains if you're not the hillfolk or if you don't have a dragon or zombies. 
Obviously, the dragon could retreat onto any type of area, so it's going to be fine in this case. Now, we could retreat to any adjacent area around here, and I think we'll just retreat up to here. The reason for that is because if we instead retreat down there, I think we're just inviting the Hillfolk players to move up there and try to pillage that village next. Instead, by going over here, perhaps we can amass a force up here on our next turn and then move down and then catch the Hillfolk player unawares, or it's possible they'll just pillage this and then leave knowing that this dragon makes things pretty scary to fight over here. They feel like they got a little bit lucky with that battle. They only had plus three combat from their pieces, whereas we had plus five. But of course, they did have a better tile to substitute in than we did, and that was part of the reason why they won. Now, I do want to point out once again that citadels are units, as are castles that you can build into areas. Now, neither of these can move, so that means if you lose a battle and you have either of this type of unit in an area, then when you retreat, all units that can retreat will go to one spot, and then all castles and citadels will be destroyed, removing them from the board. The castles will go to the discard pile of that player, and the citadels will go in front of the player who won that battle, because every citadel is worth five points to that player once the game is over. To speak on retreating a little bit more, you are also allowed to retreat by sea routes if you have ships positioned. You simply use those ships and retreat to an adjacent area to the last of those. That being said, you cannot retreat if the ships that we would use are contested. They are contested when obviously there are opposing units in those areas. And remember on sea areas, only ships can exist and dragons. But it's very possible to have ships versus ships in the ocean. Now, the same goes for movement. You cannot move using ships that are contested, and you have to perform battles with ships if there are opposing ships in the same sea area, and the way battle works at sea is identical to land. It's worth noting every ship adds plus one strength to combat. Well, at this point, the battle is over, and unfortunately, it did not go our way. Even though we were favored to win that, we weren't super favored because obviously the Hillfolk player came in with some pretty strong units of their own. Now, if we had done the other plan that I talked about, where we put a couple ships and moved this force over here, we still probably would not have done very well. As you can see, one lizard man would have added plus one, then these swords would have added another one, and the cavalry adds plus one when fighting in the plains, and that is the plains. So this would have been plus three, but of course, with our dragon and our lizard man, we had plus five, and we did still lose that. So I think this ultimately was the best plan for us, even though it did not really go our way. Either way, at this point, we do still have one tile in our hand, and we could perform an action with it, but I think let's hold on to this and use it to build some more villages, considering it looks like one of ours is going to be pillaged very soon. So let's do that. We will discard this to get four village build points. And I think the best thing for us right now is going to be building four villages over here on this island, because as you can see, we could build one there for one. That is one. The forest is also one, and this other forest is one. Uh, we're doing this because, again, it's good to get these villages out for scoring once we go through all of our stacks of tiles. And we can see that right now none of our opponents are particularly close to this island, whereas the hill folk are relatively close over here in our business. The undead player seems to be moving to the east, although they could change that and head to the west at some point soon. But they can't actually put ships down to cross over here until they have a turn where they build a village next to this. So we have a little bit of warning until something like that happens. Well, at this point, we can finish our turn by drawing tiles. And it looks like we spent all six of our tiles on that turn, so we have to draw six more. Oh, wow. <laughs> we drew our other dragon. We only have two in this entire set. That is pretty nice to see. Well, it's now time for the Hillfolk to take their turn, and the first step of the turn is pillage. For the first time in the game, a player does have an opportunity to pillage. They can do this because they have at least one of their units in an area with an opposing village. They have decided to do this, and as I mentioned before, when you pillage, you must spend exactly one of your tiles, and then the number of pips that show up on that tile is the amount of destruction points that you can use to remove these villages, and the amount of destruction points you need is equal to the building points for that village. Now, they're going to discard these skirmishers, and they show two pips. So that means they have two destruction points to use. And once again, in order to build, you have to spend one build point to go onto the plains, one for forest, and two for the hills. So in order to destroy a village on the plains, it will take one point. So they can use one of the two that they have to pillage this village, and then they will put it in front of them. Now, as I mentioned before, at the end of the game, every village you have pillaged will be worth one victory point. So they can keep that right over there. And they did gain two pips, and up to this moment, they've only spent one. 
but unfortunately for them, they don't have any other opportunities to spend the other pip in order to pillage any other villages. So the other pip will be wasted, and they're still fine with that. It was a relatively weak tile overall, and now that they have pillaged this, they will keep this off to the side for the rest of the game as one point. This also means the Hillfolk player has increased their foothold over here, because obviously we can't build here now that our village has been destroyed. That being said, they are still right next to a dragon. Now the Hillfolk are going to move on to the actions phase of their turn, and if they wanted to, they could continue to move these around, maybe going over here to try and pillage this one and force us to react. They could also go up there and fight that dragon, although it is in the forest, so that would take two movement points to get up there but they've decided they're not going to commit to that. If they did, we could simply run away with our dragon. Of course, that would maybe leave this village open to being pillaged, but we could then come back in with the dragon and potentially other units, and these are very strong units. If they lost this battle, they would have to remove one of them, and removing either of these would be a pretty big hit to the hill folk, considering these giants are so great at combat, and the leader is so great at efficiently moving units around. Now, they've decided instead to discard this and do a movement. That is going to give them three movement points, and they are going to head back over here for one, and then they're going to move this cavalry into that forest, which will take their last two movement points. Next up, they're going to move again, and they'll discard this castle. That gives them four movement points, and they've decided to go here for one, and then after that, they'll enter the forest, which costs two movement, and they'll use their last movement going into the plains. Now that is a much scarier army right there than it was before, but of course the hill folk have spent a decent amount of resources doing this. They actually started the round with one less tile than normal because they used a tile during our turn in order to help with that attack. Now, if they had wanted to, they could have moved things differently and actually perhaps moved in here to try and pillage more, but they felt like not completely overcommitting for the moment. For all they know, we could have another dragon. They also know that the Necromancer player is on the board, and the farther they move away from here, the farther they are to come back to potentially try and defend some of their base holdings. So it looks like the Hillfolk aren't going to be attacking at all, and now they're going to move into their village build step. They will discard these swords. That gives them four pips, which they can use for constructing villages. And they've decided to use the first build point to go into that forest. They'll use their second one to go into these plains right here. The third they will put into this forest, and then they'll put the fourth one back over here into those plains. All right, they can now finish their turn by drawing back up to a hand of six tiles. And now the necromancers can go. They don't have any pillage targets, and they currently don't have any zombies to move out on the board, so that means they can jump right to the action step of their turn. And they've decided to build this cavalry right over here. That will cost them two tiles, so they'll discard both of these from their hand. And then they've decided to discard both of these ships in order to gain eight pips for movement. The first of these they will use with this new cavalry, and they're going to move it right down here into the plains, which will take one movement. Then they will take this cavalry and use two more movement crossing these plains. They have five movement left, so they can go here and there, which brings them to three. And then they'll go here and there, bringing all of those units over here into what looks like it's going to be a pretty big battle. They've used seven out of their eight movement, and they've decided to use their last movement to bring the siege engine over here. After that, they've decided it's time to battle. Obviously, they have to have a battle because they have units over here with ours, but they could choose when, and considering they only have a single tile left in their hand, now seems like a pretty good time for them. Now, the first part of the battle has the defender potentially retreating. We have a single cavalry, but unfortunately, the undead player thought ahead, and they brought in two cavalry. We could only retreat if we had an equal amount or more cavalry, but they have more than us, so we don't even have the option of trying to flee. Now we can draw battle tiles. They have four compared to our three. That means that they have the most, so they will draw four tiles, and we don't have the most, so we will draw three. Each of us can take one of these bags, and we're hoping to see a better set of these tiles than we did last time. Ooh, it looks like we got two fives. Wow, that's awesome. The two, not so much, but still, that's a very good pull. At the same time, the Necromancers are going to draw, and they get four of these. And then after that, since they are the attacker, they have the option of swapping one of these out with the only tile they happen to have in their hand. Remember, they can do this at most once. They have decided they're going to, though. They're going to swap this one out with the only tile they had. 
And now as the defender, we get to do the same. Now, this was a good pull, five and five, and we could swap this two out with our dragon. If we did that, we of course would be discarding the dragon, and we would not be able to use them out as a unit for quite some time. Remember, we are going to remake our deck as soon as we go through all of those tiles, so we would get this back at some point later on in the game, but that's a pretty costly tile to put in. Now, we would like to win this battle, but I'm not sure if we want to win it that badly. When we look at our hand, we do have a Swords, which has four pips, and it's very possible we could lose this battle by a single pip, but I feel like it's probably better to keep that dragon in our hand for a future turn. So I think we will swap this two out with this four pip Swords, and then we can reveal all of our tiles. Unfortunately for us, it looks like the Necromancer had a pretty good pull as well. They have 5 plus 4 plus 5. They put another one of those Necromancer units down on there. Those are very powerful tiles to be using, so they are obviously committing a bunch of resources to making this battle work. So currently they are at 14, and over here we are also at 14. So now it's time for us to count up the benefits we get for our units. Now unfortunately, our Lizardmen isn't doing anything for us because we are defending. They only add plus one when attacking, the swords add plus one, and the cavalry adds plus one whenever we are fighting in planes, which we are. So that means we have plus two, and that brings us up to 16. And then over here, these goblins add plus one when attacking, and they are. The necromancer adds plus one always. And then both of these cavalry add plus one when fighting in the planes. So that means, unfortunately, our opponent has plus four. So they have 18 strength compared to our 16. And that means we are losing this one. So that's two battles that we lost so far in this game. I think we certainly overextended ourselves heading way over here. Now these tiles can be discarded, and we can also get rid of these. Then the Necromancer player will gain points equal to the number of units on the losing side. We have three units, so they gain three points, which will bring them up to three. After that, as the loser, we have to defeat one of these units, and the Lizardmen are definitely the weakest out of these, so we will defeat them. Now, at this moment, we can see that the Necromancer player had a Necromancer in that battle. Now, whenever a Necromancer is in a battle and they win, they summon a zombie into this area for every opposing unit that was destroyed. Obviously, one opposing unit was destroyed, so that means the Necromancer has summoned the first zombie onto the map. If you remember from before, the Necromancer player can move these around during the second step of their turns, and they can move into any type of area except for the seas, but they can use ships. Now, these zombies can always move up to two spaces every turn, so they are a very efficient way to project power, and these zombies also always add plus one to every combat they are in. So that's certainly worrisome, and now we have to retreat. Honestly, I think it was a mistake to come over here at all so early in the game, so I think let's use our ship and retreat across the seas. Uh, there's a bunch of units over here, and our dragons up there as well, and there's certainly benefits to clustering up powerful stacks of units as an attack force. So I think we are going to retreat back over here to where our citadel is, and maybe we can combine them with this dragon that we already have out there on the map. I think we are very likely to be giving up on that frontier village that we put down on the first turn of the game. All right, that battle is done, and at this point, the Necromancer player is done with their actions, and they are going to skip their building villages step. They have zero tiles in front of them, so obviously they cannot afford to actually put any more villages out here. They dedicated their entire turn to having a successful attack over here. They really wanted to start getting zombies on the map as soon as they could. And of course, they also got three points for defeating our forces, and they will very likely gain another point from pillaging this village at the start of their next turn. The cost of all that is they aren't building out any more villages, and now they can move into the draw step of their turn. As I said, they used all of their previous tiles, so they will draw until they have six total. Well, the Necromancers are done with a rather impactful turn, and now it would be time for us to go, but I think instead of that, I'd now like to talk about what happens once the game is over. Remember, the game end will be triggered in a three- or four-player game once every player has gone through their entire deck twice, and in a two-player game, that would happen once both players have gone through their entire decks three times. And remember, every time you go through your deck of tiles and you need to draw more, that is the moment that you score one point for every one of the villages that you have out here on the map. We've already had one village pillaged and another one that's probably going to go, but we do still have quite a few villages out here already, and I imagine we will continue to be pressing to get more of them out, in particular up here in this forest in the north. 
Once the game is over, there's a couple of steps that we have to do before we have our final score. And the first of these is we have to perform all of the battles that might still be out here. Now remember, a battle is a mandatory action if on your turn as the active player, you have your units in an area with opposing units. But it's very possible that somebody could attack somebody else. That opposing player who is not active then retreats into another area that has units of another non-active player. In that case, there is going to be a battle that happens in that area, but not on the active player's turn. And if there are any of those situations out here, once the game end is triggered, we then have to perform all of those battles. And we do those in order from the player to the left of the player who triggered the end of the game. Once all remaining battles have been resolved, the next step of final scoring is every player will pillage every single village that they have the option to, and they don't have to spend any pips. So effectively, that means if there is opposing villages in areas with your units, you just pillage those, removing them from the board without expending any tiles. So at this point, it's possible that many of these villages could be pillaged off of the board, depending on how players position themselves as the game end was closing in. After that, all players will score one victory point for every opposing village they pillage throughout the game, and they will also gain five extra points for every opposing citadel they destroyed throughout the game. Once we add those points to the score that we already had, the player with the most victory points will be the winner. Now, if at that point there's a tie, then the tied player who has the most villages still on the map will break it in their favor. If there is still a tie, then the player who gained the most victory points from pillaging is going to break it in their favor. And if there is still a tie, then the tied player's share in the victory. Well, at this point, I do believe I've taught just about all of the rules to the game, and I think that's going to bring this tutorial to a close. I know that we only saw the first couple of rounds of the game, where we are still building out and taking over territory, and I do want to mention that in general, the first rounds don't have that much combat. It makes a lot more sense to build out your infrastructure, making a holding out here on the map, than running over here to the east as I did, but I wanted to make a situation where fighting happened a little bit earlier, so that I could show you a couple different ways for how it could go down. Even so, after just a couple of rounds, a whole bunch of stuff has happened out here on the map. As you can see, we've retreated back to our citadel. The hill folk have kind of headed over here to the west, but considering there's a gigantic necromancer army right here, including a zombie now, it's likely the hill folk are going to stop messing with us and maybe start heading down. And if that does happen, then I think we would try to capitalize on that by maybe making some land gains up there at the north, maybe even amassing a large army of our own to head over here, or maybe to put some more villages down and zoom over here to try and hit the Necromancer player while they're perhaps out of position somewhere else on the map. We are the only ones with a ship so far, and getting some more ships out here would certainly be good. Although right now we don't have any ships, so I'm not sure how soon we'd be able to pull that off. Either way, as you can see, this game could go in all sorts of directions from this point, and I hope this has given you a good idea for how the overall flow of this game can go, where players need to really think about how they're going to expend their resources, whether they be as units on the map, moving units around the map, or building out infrastructure with villages, or even helping out with battle. Well, at this point, the tutorial is coming to a close, and I do hope you've enjoyed learning how to play Bloodstones. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.